Hi, my name is Nathan Gerke. I'm going to be going over active methods of orbital determination. So, in orbital determination, you have optical telescopes and you have radio telescopes. Optical telescopes observe a shorter wavelength, which give higher or more precise results. However, it's limited in its tracking capabilities as um, it's limited by weather. And it's also limited in that it can only be used at night. Radio telescopes are not inhibited by weather or time. Um, however, they are limited by having a much higher power requirement. So in this presentation, we're gonna look deeper into radio telescopes and different forms of radio orbital determination. So we have two different types of radio observation. There's passive and there's active. Passive uses more power than active um, as it, it takes a signal from the ground transmission to be beamed up to the satellite and reflected back down in order to determine the position and the velocity of the satellite, um, which, which takes in a lot more power than that of the active methods, which actually uses the transmitted signal from the satellite to determine the position and the velocity. Um, so there's far less power used in the active. Um, one benefit of passive though is that it only requires one operating frequency where active needs to be able to adjust depending on which satellite and what the satellite's transmission is. So we're going to look into two different methods, two different active methods of radio telescope observation. Um, the first of which is radio interferometers. Radio interferometer is uh, an array of radio telescopes that are used to synthesize a larger aperture in that the diameter of the dish is not the actual diameter of the individual dishes. It's the distance between the dishes, which is the diameter. Um, now this is used in orbital de determination through phase differences between these um, radio telescopes, which allow us to determine the azimuth and elevation angle of the satellite from the ground. Now, as seen by this picture, there's the telescope on the right and the telescope on the left, both receiving the same radio waves from the satellite. The one on the right is gonna receive the wave before that of the one on the left. Um, and the distance is shown as delta phi on the image. Um, now this can be calculated because the two uh, telescopes are synced together by determining the time between the reception and we know the wavelength of the ray and we know the distance between them. Um, and this can allow us to calculate theta, which is the angle from zenith to the vector um, of the satellite. So with that, we can be able to compute the orbital elements. Now, the phase difference equation is shown below as uh, delta P is equal to two times D, the distance between the uh, telescopes over lambda, the frequency, times sine of theta, where theta is the angle we're looking for. Now, with only two antennas, um, one cannot accurately determine the azimuth and elevation um, as it's not able to do that in 3D space. So in order to actually fix those angles to the satellite, you need a minimum pair of four antennas or four pairs of antennas, um, which can be done with five antennas where you have four unique, all paired with the same fifth antenna. And that would allow you to fix the azimuth and elevation angles to the satellite. So with that, you have the time in which the um, information was gathered from the telescopes, and you have fixed azimuth and elevation angles from the four different pairs, as well as knowing the ground station location. Um, and with that, one could calculate the orbital parameters or the position and the, vec po position and the velocity vectors through a number of different methods, one of which uh, you could use is the Gauss method. Now, radio interferometers have successfully been used before and were first used by Sputnik. Um, they are, however, limited by frequency. 
um, as antennas are designed for specific um, frequency bands. So uh, they couldn't be used uh, wide range for every satellite. Um, and you'd either have to design your array for a satellite or design your satellites for an array. Now, the second method of Doppler, the second method of uh, orbital determination um, that we're going to go over is another active radio method, which is Doppler tracking. Now, as seen by the image below, there's a satellite passing over a ground station. When the satellite's approaching the ground station, the received frequency on the ground is greater than the actual transmitted frequency due to the speed of the satellite approaching the ground station. Now, as the satellite's moving away from the ground station, the received frequency is less than that of the transmitted frequency as the satellite is going rapidly away. Now, this Doppler curve um, or Doppler frequency shift um, ranges from hundreds uh, to thousands of hertz off of the true transmitted frequency. Um, and this, when the ground station is known, can be used to calculate the orbital information. So, as said before, the ground station information is known. The Doppler curve then can be solved. The Doppler equation is rho da, where rho is the range rates, is equal to c, the speed of light, times the quantity of 1 minus v prime over v, where v prime is the receiver frequency and v is the transmitted frequency. Now, this equation can be used to determine the range rates. Now, I'm going to go through the solution method for orbital determination, but I'm not going to go too deep into the actual equations. Um, if you want to uh, go deeper in and figure out the equations to calculate this, you can go into my references section and look at Paul Richards' journal article. And he has all the equations necessary. So for Doppler tracking, the solution method is as follows. You select your initial conditions where you guess your position, x, y, and z, and your velocity, x dot, y dot, z dot. And from that, you utilize equations detailed in Paul Richards' journal article um, where you solve the equations of motion for those time-dependent position and velocity components. With those equations of motion, you can compute new values for range rates. And remember, we already have our uh, values of range rates from the Doppler curve. So we'll compare those computed values with the data from the Doppler curve um, to see if those match. Um, and you're going to adjust your initial conditions and continue to iterate until the range rates are within a specified tolerance of each other. And when they are, then those initial conditions are your conditions for position and velocity at this time of observation. So you're going to have a measurement. So measurement of frequency is one dimensional. Um, so you're going to require six measurements for complete orbital determination. More than six will yield more accurate results as you'll be able to filter through your information. Um, orbital determination can be determined quick. Um, as you only need one ground station and one satellite pass for Doppler tracking, which makes it a lower cost option, um, but it will have lower fidelity results than other options. Overall, active methods of orbital determination provide sufficient results at a lower cost with lower power requirements and can eliminate the dependency of outside sources and agencies um, if uh, you were needing to track your own satellite. These are possible, possible ways to go. Um, I hope you've learned something from this presentation and have a good day.